that you will just throw all of these lovely colored pens at me if I misspeak you. But, <laughs> but I think I think both of these are books that we spent a lot of time and a lot of thought on, and, and were very very hard at some points um, for different reasons that we didn't expect. Um, so I think. Usually a Q and A, you're like, oh, what will we have to talk about? But I feel we have a lot to talk about um, for both of these books. But we'll open it up to you. If you guys don't raise your hands, we'll start talking to each other. And you hear that. <laughs> you know, um, I'm right now talking. Usually, traditionally, when we ask for questions, there's a minute pause before somebody deigns to raise their hand. Um, so that's this minute. I'm talking right now. Pretend that I asked who has questions a minute ago. So when in about roughly 30 seconds, when I say who has questions, it's as if it's the minute later. So that awkward pause before somebody raises their hand, it just won't happen. You will have our eternal gratitude if you're the first one to ask questions. We'll sign your book extra long when you bring it up to do it. I mean, we'll personalize it. We'll just say wonderful things, especially thank you for writing for asking the first question. Does anybody have a question? Thank you. Um, Liva, how much, when you were starting with Going Bovine, how much research did you put into uh, mad cow disease or like anything that went into the book? Did you just immediately start writing or? Um, actually, this, this has an interesting tale behind it, which is kind of funny. <laughs> 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 no funny. Uh, thank you folks, I'll be here all night. Do you drink that um, Which is that I actually wrote this book between books two and three of the trilogy. So between oh. Rebel Angels and the Sweet Bar Thing. And the deal was that Cynthia Letty Smith, who is <laughs> a lovely frigid air. Thank you, Carol Merrill. Um, so uh, Cynthia Letty Smith, who is this wonderful YA author who lives in Austin, was going to do a writing festival. She was, she was doing a writing workshop. And she called me while I was working on Rebel Angels and said, do you want to do this writing workshop? And honestly, she could have said, can I take all your jewelry and, and remove one of your kidneys? And I would have said, sure, because I was deep into the book. So it was like November, and she said, all right, but I'm going to need a full manuscript by May 1st if you're going to partic participate. And I said, great, sure, no problem, take my kidney. And uh, so, of course, as usual, um, uh, one of my favorite writers, Douglas Adams, once gave my favorite quote about deadlines. He said, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing sound they make as they pass by. <laughs> David's going to edit a book for me soon, so get Real ready, babe. Soon. Get ready, babe. Um, so I was late, and it was February, and all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, I have to write a book between now and May 1st. Well, I had had this idea for a really long time. There was a man in my hometown who contracted CJ, Kreutzfeldt Jakob's disease, which is the human variant of mad cow disease. And he, uh, uh, it's really a very horrible disease because it destroys your brain. And um, he began to see hallucinations. And one of the hallucinations was that he would see these flames shooting up into his field of vision. And that horrified me and haunted me. Um, because I thought, if you can't trust your reality, what, what is that like? That, that's horrifying to me. So that had just haunted me for years before I even started to write on this. And I just thought, I, there's something about that that I want to write. Um, and then the other, one of the other pieces of it was that I had uh, been looking at Don Quixote, which I love and had always kind of wanted to do something with. And I'd also kind of wanted to play in the playground that I happen to love, which is like Monty Python and Kurt Vonnegut and <laughs> Douglas Adams and, and National Lampoon, and all of those guys that I happen to really, really love. So I'd rather to write something funny um, and absurdist. So all of this sort of came together. And then I actually started doing some research on Mad Cow. And of course, it's really horrific to read all that stuff. I mean, to find out what it does to you. But one of the things that I found interesting, and one of the reasons that I, I ultimately decided that that was absolutely the disease that I was going to, to use, is that um, initially when people have symptoms, a lot of the symptoms that they exhibit, people think that they're psychological, people think that they're on drugs. It's, it seems to mirror what the culture might call typical teen behavior. Certain outbursts, um, sort of not, not being entirely comfortable with your body, having weird things happen. So there were, there were parallels there that I thought, okay, so this is something that he might, you know, people might be saying, well, you know, He's a, he's a real pain in the ass 16 year old, you know, and that was, that was part of it too. But I did a fair amount of research on that. I did a fair amount of research on string theory 
and parallel world theory. Um, one of the things that I think is great about research is what I call the Kevin, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon of research, <laughs> because it's like you start to research one thing, and then you're like, wow, now I need to read up on Niels Bohr. All right, well now I need, you know, now that I've looked at double slit experiments, now let me look at, you know. And the deadlines, whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother me. I'm, I'm studying Ed Witten. And that's great. Can you get this novel? Um, so, so to me, that's part of the fun of, of everything is, is being able to have the, you know, the one thing that leads you to another thing that leads you to something completely far afield that you never thought that you'd be studying. I had no idea that string theory was going to somehow relate to Don Quixote and Mad Cow disease. <laughs> well, yes, they did. You should see my salad. <laughs> wow, I did not know you could put pineapple, <laughs> prosciutto, and Cheerios. That's <laughs> <laughs> How much research did you do? I mean, in terms of, I mean, I know you were I know you were I watched there. the towers fall. I know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hearing that piece um, and about walking down to where the lights were, I I, I was I was thinking about that. Well, no, that I mean, again, a lot of it was based on <coughs> experience. Luckily for me, I on the day itself I was at work, which was about 20 blocks north of the trade center. We have a roof deck that I was on watching downtown um, when the second plane hit and everything that happened after. But sort of during that day, I would run down to my office and type basically type out these emails to my friends, just saying this is what's going on, because um, many of them were not in New York and just. Once I did that, it, it sort of set the pace to continue to do that. So every now and then, I would just send out an email to people. This is before blogging largely, but ultimately, what I was doing was doing a blog and not realizing it and sending it just to my friends. And so a lot of the research I did was just basically going back to all the emails I had sent about it and, and seeing what happened when and what I did. And the lights was definitely one of them. Um, and then probably the, the low point of humor in my life was um, when Billy and Nico, my best friend, got, got married, um, and we were on the, the wedding cruise, and I had to fact check. And so one day everybody was in the pool, and I was in my room with the 9 11 report, making, like reading the chronology, making sure that I had everything to the minute. It's, You're a good it's a fun. really, yeah, it's a really, <laughs> you know, nobody wanted to talk to me that night at dinner. But, but it was interesting because you do, you have your memory, and then. This is something that is literally documented minute by minute, so you have to make sure everything is going. And one of the one of the really interesting things about the book has been that everybody has a 9/11 story, no matter where you are. This isn't like, oh yeah, that, whatever. Like, so it's been really interesting hearing from New Yorkers, from non-New Yorkers, everybody else's experience, um, and that it brought back a lot of things for people that we, again, we just sort of forget the details. I mean, the, one of the crucial things that happened, strangely, in this book is two nights after 9-11, there was a torrential downpour. Um, and it just, it really, it seemed biblical. But of course, you don't remember, oh, it rained two days later. But because I've written it down and because it intersected with this data, I, I remember it. Or even something as big at the time as, I mean, somebody in Brooklyn, I mean, just when the towers hit, like all these papers from the towers, like blew and the wind was blowing towards Brooklyn. And so all of these arcane memorandum and all these, like this paperwork, literally from the impact of the first plane blew into Brooklyn. So we'd walk around Brooklyn picking up papers from the towers. And, and again, it was so defining at the moment, but now when you think of 9-11, that's not one of the first things you think of, but it was so much a part of the experience. So, so it was, the experience was just, being willing to go back there, um, which was not necessarily an easy thing. I mean, I would say I'm a bad test case because even before I wrote the book, I felt like you couldn't, you you had to think about it at least once a day. Like there would be something that would come up either on the news or you'd look downtown and see the absence. And now, of course, I think about it much more because of this book. Like it, it just, you had to, or I had to commit to going back and remembering it. Right? Um, I thought, and it sort of says in the book, that I thought that there would be dozens of writers who would write novels about it, both YA and adult, and it's been amazing to me how few have. Um, and I think part of that is a hesitation to do it. But anyway. And then I injected myself with mad cow disease. And <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Marie Curie form of authorship. I gotta, I gotta say, you are full service. Also, I like that. I like <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs>